to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend, Charles. I am ready to talk some fantasy with my friend as well, Dylan, and not just any fantasy today, because today we are returning to one of the most popular fantasy authors of our time, and one of his most popular series of his time. We're talking about book three of the Stormlight Archive, which is Oathbringer by Brandon Sanderson. Wow, what an epic journey it has been, even to get to book three out of the four that have been released so far. Mm -hmm. It is just epic in every sense (laughs) of the word. This Stormlight Archive series, Branson Sanderson's magnum opus, and we're we're so close, Charles. We're so close to being fully caught up. We're we're a mere thousand or so pages <laughs> away. <laughs> I know it's been thousands of pages, like hunt, like over a hundred, over a hundred fifty audiobook hours, easy. And um, yeah, it, quite an epic journey it has been. I feel like you know, in movies, movie studios have what they call tentpole movies where they know that they're going to make a lot of money and they kind of fund the other movies that they release. Um, like Sony will make a Spider-Man movie or, a, or you know, there'll be a James Bond movie or something, and those are tent poles. And then you have the, like, other smaller movies around it. I feel like talking about Brandon Sanderson and talking about the Stormlight today, it's, gonna, it's like a tent pole episode. It's like, this is a big deal. This is Oathbringer. So, yeah, super excited to get into it. And... It is what I'm, you know, we've got a lot to talk about here. There's a lot of plot that happened, like not here to give you guys a summary. We're assuming you've read the book and I'm sure Dylan will give a wonderful spoiler warning for that, but we are going to just have fun talking about the book and sharing our thoughts. And uh, before we get into that, Dylan, yeah, do your thing. All right, we're going to have a no-holds-barred conversation about Oathbringer here, which means that if you have not yet read Oathbringer or the previous installment in the series, primarily that would be Way of Kings and uh, Words of Radiance. Yeah, I don't think there's too much to spoil from Edge Dancer, but if you're worried, of, if you're so worried and you haven't yet read that, then <laughs> sure, give that a read too. Ooh. Absolutely. But... We will not be spoiling anything from Beyond Oathbringer because Charles and I haven't read anything Beyond Oathbringer, so we couldn't even do it if we wanted to. We're finally caught up. Yeah. (laughs) You've always been ahead of me, so this is very exciting. (laughs) Yes, we're finally at the same place. But if you listener are not yet at the same place, then now is a good time to turn this down in your headphones if you do not want to hear anything spoiled. Very good. Yes, Um, that would be an excellent time because we're about to tackle one of the larger books in the series so far, and that is Oathbringer. Now, Dylan, how are we going to go about tackling this epic of a book as part of an epic of a series? I mean, do you start from the beginning or do you start with the character? Where do we go? Because we haven't talked well, about this book I yet. I think that we have not talked about this book yet. I think that if if we are going to start with a character, then I think it's pretty obvious which character to start with, and that would be Dalinar Colin. This is the Dalinar book, as we've said in the past. Uh, each book has a particular character where they really do a lot of flashbacks and flesh out their history. And we'd already gotten Kaladin, we'd already got Shallan, and, and now it is Dalinar Colin's turn, and we get to see how did this man who seems so honorable and put together now, how did he uh, go from uh, the Black Thorn, this really, uh, this war tyrant and this vicious yeah. killer, warmonger, that's what I was looking for. How did he go from that to who he is now? And what was he really like back then? And I think that's the most exciting part of this one. Agreed. And 
the reason why Dalinar is particularly interesting is because for the past two books, we've gotten his POV, but there's always been this mystery around he has no recollection of a huge chunk of his life, particularly around his wife, whose face he cannot even recall. And we've known that since we were introduced to his character in book one. We know that at one point he felt shame and blame for his brother, the king's death, because he was very drunk when the assassin attacked. And he kind of bore some of the guilt from that when we first met him. And as much as he's doesn't remember and as much as he's regretful, there's only been this image of Dalinar as being this regal authoritative presence to the point where he's kind of outshined uh, the king up to this point and everyone kind of sees him as the official authority and in the end of the last book he went on to like found the knight's radiance so this is a, a huge thing for Dalinar but everything we learn about him even like he's at like the highest pedestal you can achieve in terms of like glory amongst men at the beginning of this book but you learn his backstory and it is riddled with um tough decisions and bloodshed and and just black spots in his seemingly pristine history so i do think that what this book manages to kind of focus around is the more uh darker sides of dalinar and how he came up and like the horrible things that he's done and then it kind of leaves you with this idea of like is he still the same person we thought he was only knowing present day Dalinar, does knowing his history kind of affect our opinion of him? And I think that's an interesting reading experience. It definitely is, Charles. And I'm super curious to hear from you as a first time reader of this one. Do you find Dalinar's history, for lack of a better way of putting it, damning uh, in any way? Does it change the way that you think about him as a character because I think this is one of the places that uh, Sanderson at times hasn't uh, been as strong as some of the more grimdark authors is creating these protagonists that are more morally gray not that usually he's not even really trying to do that too much he likes Mm. creating these heroes that you can uh, root for but he he's definitely attempting with Dalinar here to flesh him out more as a character that has a really dark past that maybe not all of it is is worth forgiving. So did you walk away, Charles, uh, with your opinion changed on Dalinar? And also, what do you think of Sanderson's uh, uh, fleshing out of a more morally gray character? Yeah, that's a really good question because we even find this in real life all the time it's like you look back at some great historical figures and you learn some unsavory things about their life and it's like well do i hate this person now or what like what's going on here and certainly downar did his fair share um what i do like about it and what i think is like a big kind of growth point for sanderson is that he's willing to make his heroes unlikable and I feel like in the past, I'm thinking something like Mistborn, for example, like any time a character did something kind of violent or nasty, you always found it. It was like the purpose was endearing in some way a lot of times, right? So it's like, oh, I only hurt the bad guys to protect the innocent kind of thing. And Dalinar is very much that. But I think in the attempt to write your epic story, nothing is going to be like when you're following characters for thousands of pages and like dozens of audiobook hours nothing is going to be so simple and clear cut like our heroes are going to make mistakes or our heroes are going to need to go through a redemption process and like it's also kind of a fresh of breath air uh, fresh of breath air a breath of fresh air (laughs) it is a breath of fresh air nailed it uh in that it it feels honest too like no one has gone like to be in the position that dalinar's in you have to be responsible for the deaths of a lot of people there's just no avoiding that so it's like how can you be this regal king without being kind of soaked in blood and 
Sanderson has been toying with since book one with Kaladin, this idea of like, there's no clear good. There's no clear evil. Like all I want to do is good, but I just find myself like facing contradictions and hypocrisy at every turn. And even Kaladin, as good as he tries to be, has fallen victim to this too. And and I don't think it's been challenged more than Dalinar, who's literally like a guy who has like burned entire villages, ended up killing his wife, like instigated battles and war for the sake of his own bloodlust more than anything else. And he would say it's for the realm, but really it was because he never felt more alive than when he was fighting and killing people. So yeah, it's an interesting push. It's a breath towards this more realistic approach to history and to rulers of kingdoms. And I like that Sanderson is challenging his characters and challenging himself to try and write a noble character that's also rooted in some kind of reality. I think fantasy authors a lot of times are like, well, I make the villain obviously very bad and I make the hero obviously very good and there's no problems. When you fight a bunch of battles and unite the kingdoms and defeat the evil person, you're doing good the whole time. And I think Sanderson, writing a book in the modern age, is trying to bring in more of the realities of life and I think he's kind of found it to, you know, he's embracing the challenges of that. And Dalinar is an example of where it's particularly challenging because of all this horrible stuff that he's done. So yeah, I enjoyed it uh, as an experience for the reader and I like that he doesn't let Dalinar off the hook because like the details that he goes into and the atrocities that he's done are very detailed for a Sanderson novel. So I do respect that. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it as well. I'm with you there, Charles. I think that what you bring up about him not letting down or off the hook is such a great point, And it is exemplified by the aspect that at the end of the book, the conclusion of his arc in this novel, uh, Dalinar is given the chance to be let off the hook uh, by Odium, right? He's Mm -hmm. directly told, hey, this kind of stuff, it wasn't your fault. It was the thrill, and the thrill is me, Odium, working through you. So you, you don't have to blame yourself for it. Just, like, give in. And Dalinar himself does not let himself off of the hook because he's like, no, this is something that I did. This was my choice, and I'm not going to let you have my uh, pain, I believe is what he says. And he's like, I'm going to take responsibility for all these horrible things that I've done. And it's, it's growth for Sanderson and having a character that is willing to do that or that he's willing to show the reader, hey, this person did make these choices and I'm going to ask you to consider them to be one of my heroes anyway because Mm -hmm. of their redemption and their willingness to take accountability for the things that they did. So it's uh, Sanderson growing in that way and, of course, Dalinar growing alongside him by taking that accountability that I was mentioning. And I, I think that it's it's really a triumph for both Sanderson and Dalinar. <laughs> and for I sure. really appreciate both those parallels and just Dalinar's arc and growth throughout this book. Well said. And I think it Brandon Sanderson doesn't even let himself off the hook because it compounds, right? Because you have Dalinar who... Uh, has this challenging past and we're trying to figure out can he still do good like what do we do with these complications that we're facing when we're trying to do good and then towards the end of the book you have the realization that it is the humans that are the invading force so now you have this character who is trying to do the right thing by uniting, like creating the Knights Radiant, uniting the kingdoms, protecting their homeland, right? These are all like the things that he's doing for these noble causes. And he's doing it in part because he knows it's the noble thing to do. And then there's the crashing reality of we're actually the, we're the baddies. We're the invaders originally. So in trying to do what we think is right, 
we're actually going against history and we're just continuing to be the invaders. But this is the only home we've known and we've had it this whole time. So it's like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You're protecting the homeland you've had your whole life and for generations. But you're also continuing the historical trend of humanity wreaking havoc on this planet. So it's like, what even is right? No one knows. There's no one answer to what is right. But you have a whole cast of characters that want to do the right thing. So the challenge isn't just in doing the right thing and succeeding. It's it's figuring out what the right thing even is to do. And I think that's the breakthrough for the Stormlight Archive and for these characters. It's like... We all want to do the right thing, but it is not easy to figure out what that is. And it's Sanderson does a very good job in compounding that in like his characters and their backstories. And then like the history of this world, which we get a lot of in this book. So the way those two come together at the head point of this story for Dalinar's arc is is um, pretty much the whole capstone of the whole book it, it, and it's an interesting thought i'm not sure what the right move to do is if i was in down our shoes i'd be like do we just stop doing stuff or do we do more stuff like i don't know it's a tough call it's definitely a tough call charles and that's that reveal is one of the ones that characterizes this this series for me it's always one that i think back to because I can't think of a ton of examples in fantasy where they've fl- people have been willing to flip it on its head like that and make our heroes confront that complicated situation of uh, where the uh, baddies, at least in in a way that's as surprising as this one, right? Mm. It's there's other ones where you could probably think like, oh, there are people very deliberately colonizing at this moment and uh then they come to realize oh maybe what we're doing is wrong but there's a whole nother thing where they had no idea this is something so like far back in their history that it's a complete revelation for them and they they find out this is what tore apart the knights radiant uh, in in the past where they they felt like they couldn't go on so we'll have to see in future books how do our current Knights Radiance deal with this we've got uh, Calden having conversations with Sill where he's like oh well I'm I'm personally not going to do it but I can see that things have really changed and I understand why in the past people were unable to go on with this so how seriously will the humans the Knights Radiant take their oaths this time around uh, will they break them in the way that it, uh, uh, the Stormfather is always saying that they will? Or will they keep going? And how will they get their conscience is to rest when they're right. trying to deal with all of this? And, and we as readers, uh, where do we land? It's it's all very interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of interesting to see, like, I don't know. It's, it's not fair to spoil other works from Sanderson, but he's done this before where it's like good intentions plus ignorance equals accidentally doing working against what we thought we were doing or maybe doing something that had we known we probably wouldn't have done. Um, there's think of reveals in like true yeah 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 i'm not i don't know if i should say but i'm uh, just realizing but yeah no 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 i know but it's it's deep into series so right right it's one of those things that's That's like he he's done this before but where i think he differs is he's just dwelling in it and exploring it so much more at a way more intense level in this story than in his other works um it's a fantastic reveal and it's one of those ones that's like you, you know you have all these characters kaladin dalinar shallan like that are very likable very you know noble seeming guy like, obviously they're good we don't doubt that but they're all flawed and their pursuit is not a perfect one it's complicated it, they're it's a tough choice so it's definitely a when you're thinking about epic fantasy i I like that as epic as the world and the history is and it certainly feels like that really 
expands in this one like the the scope of this world the world building does open up quite a bit in this one but um the themes go with it as well and i, I think that's super important for an epic fantasy series like this that you're able to do to do both and i think that's why stormlight archive in particular is, is such a standout for me when i think of like the number of epic fantasy series that i've read so big props there too Mm, get you a series that can do both charles that's what we <laughs> get you got. a series that right can here. do both well said <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah that's the exciting plotting and twists and reveals that we've come to expect from sanderson and another that i want to discuss i think is one of the more interesting i don't think it's a reveal or a twist but like plot events that happens is uh, Elokar's death and uh, Moash killing Elokar. This is a really big moment in the series. It's it's definitely a game changer, and it's one that, along with some other actions, have led folks to have a ton of animosity toward Moash as a character. <laughs> I don't know if you knew about this phenomenon, Charles, but uh, mm-hmm. there's there's a word I can't say to keep our clean rating here on uh, FTF, uh, but there is, there's even a subreddit with 10.8 thousand members, Charles, called F Moash, and they, they spell out the, the full four-letter word. So that's 10.8 thousand people who hate Moash now, with that level. Did they level. hate him because of what he's done, or did they hate him as a character in the world, like Jar Jar Binks? Like, what's the... <laughs> they hate him, no, they hate him because of what he's done. Okay. I would compare it, I think it is kind of a play on the F. Ollie thing from Game of Thrones, we won't reveal what Ollie did, but you remember... Oh, okay. Remember so Ollie it's like they're like they're not Game criticizing the written character. They're criticizing like they're they feel betrayed and heartbroken and they really hate him for yes. the atrocity. Yeah, that's I mean that's a sign of success for an author, I suppose, is when you have people just hating. You have your ten point eight thousand people <laughs> who hate your one character enough to like contribute to a, an active subreddit on the <laughs> topic. Yeah, Sanderson's probably doing pretty good, and and yeah, I don't. I don't think there's a lot of like criticizing him as a character. It's more just uh, a good natured let's rally behind this character that we feel betrayed by. Right. And Charles, did you feel betrayed by Moash? Do you will you be joining the subreddit? I would say it was heartbreaking because you were kind of holding out hope for Moash from the last book, like Kaladin had the big face off, and and you got the sense that there was maybe a redemption arc coming for him. And you, you know, I was open to that as a possibility. I was like, okay, like I can see Kaladin and Bridge Four bringing Moash back into the fold. You know, it would be complicated, but it's not impossible. And now it's become much harder since he's committed a regicide. Uh, so mm. I don't know how you come back from that one. And that was kind of the feeling I had of like, okay, well. <laughs> Any hopes I had of a redemption anytime soon are are long gone. Certainly still not uh, off the table completely, but the odds just went way down. So in that sense, I could see why people feel in such a way that they would react with expletives. And um, yeah, although if I'm going to be honest with you guys, I, I wasn't like super invested in the state of our king he's he's always very paranoid and uh getting in the way of our greater characters uh and i think the way this book ends we have a a new ruler i'm like this is probably for the best for everybody i mean even kaladin was like this guy dies it's not the end of the world right like that was the last book right where he's like "Eh, if i you know i don't need to save everybody (laughs) so it's like if anyone's gonna go it's a good housekeeping on Sanderson's part. If I'm being honest, guys, if I'm being honest, good riddance. <laughs> wow. Whoa. He was, right. he was well, starting to do some likable was, things, and I'm like, I don't like this guy's chances. <laughs> yeah, so t- something that Sanderson does extremely well here is do a lot of redeeming Alokar in the 
reader's eyes as he approaches his demise. And I think that it, this one hit me hard, actually. And I think it's because he's starting to get together. He's really starting to put himself on the right track. And he's even starting to swear one of the ideals as he he does yeah. meet that demise. And that was tough. I Yeah, that part, that's a thing. This is why Sanderson is such a master of the craft, especially when it comes to his plotting, where you know he's such a thorough outliner that he was like, okay, I'm going to end up killing Elokar, but with how I've left him by the end of the last book, no one's going to care that much. Yeah. And it... <laughs> <laughs> and it reaches a because they are thinking what Calden's thinking there, like you said, Charles. Oh, if this guy dies, then it's not the worst thing in the world. And I think he he hit me in the feels. I know he's hit a lot of other folks in the feels with this, and it's because of his willingness to then start redeeming him just in time. He's like, oh, what would be the like the thing that would be the absolute biggest stab in the heart? It would be, you know, if I'm going to kill him, what would make it hit the hardest? And it'd be, he's about to become a Knight's Radiant. And that even redeems his his paranoia was he was probably actually like starting to see the spren and stuff like that. I've seen people talk about that. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. yeah. So I forget, I forget the details on that, but I, I've seen people post about like, oh, he's going to be part of this, uh, uh, part of uh, this class of Radiants and, it would have, like, you would have started seeing some stuff, and that's probably what account for the paranoia. So, Interesting. yep, Interesting we get hit pretty theory. hard by that one. Yeah. 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 And Sanderson does a good job of, you know, it's a character that's like, when you look at the way events have to go, you know, you can kind of, you know, he needs to get cleared off so our other characters can do stuff fine. But... What Sanderson does is, like you said, Dylan, he's such an extensive outliner, and that was fantastic, but he knows how to toy with our kind of, like, hopes as a reader, right? Like, we hope Moash, like, it's left open that he could still have some redemption. We hope that our king could actually kind of become friends with Kaladin and, like, reel back his paranoia. And, like, take a more proactive approach to ruling where he's actually going out on the adventure and he's actually willing to do these things. And he is the king, so you hope that that kind of keeps going. And then the very end where you hope he becomes a knight's radiant. We've seen it before where they've been healed from horrible injuries and we see it afterwards, too, uh, by swearing the oaths. So it's one of those things that's, like, he was able to like use so many ingredients to create the dish of dead king that uh it was quite the delicacy i would say like the, you can appreciate it when you see a lot of things going at once because it'd be so easy to say oh like in a movie like oh, we're getting a lot of dialogue from this character we haven't heard from a lot i think he's gonna die in the next scene uh, and in this it's a little bit more than that i'd still say it still kind of felt that way i was like oh he's going on the adventure oh he's getting a little talkative all right here we go but he kept me like hoping that he was going to survive like i was like maybe he'll survive maybe he'll come back and we've even seen it with yasna too like we watched her get speared through the ship deck and she came back but man like hopes hopes built up and and dashed away in a very in a very engaging way built off of not just the king but of Moash too and I think that's why people react so strongly yes and Moash didn't help his case by also killing a herald at the <laughs> end of the book uh, yeah he's going past the point of rough. redemption hard you know he's turning into a bigger character for sure mm. yeah and he's now got even more power because of that he receives the honor blade and we can only imagine that Moash is turning into more and more of a sincere, like, powerful antagonist, which is pretty interesting to see him go from humble beginnings of like just one of the bridgemen that has given up completely, and Calden's like, "Hey, like, let's start doing stuff." To now, he might be one of the bigger bads somehow of the 
the series in the long run. And you don't see that as often as you see the more underdog story with along lines of what most of the Bridgemen are like, like let's say Teft or something right? Uh, where they become heroes out of that. It's like, no, Moash has been able to grow beyond the <laughs> Bridgemen that's given up on life to be a terrible regicidal yes. maniac so His we will see where things go towards being an enemy and not being an ally and yeah he's not the only one i mean we got a lot of interesting povs from bridge four in this book which i thought was really interesting i liked getting into all those perspectives and i really like tef's pov i gotta say like i ha- i said it in the last um episode we talked about stormlight archive and i'll say it in this one I really like this edgier, darker Brandon Sanderson. Like he's willing to like write a person like ruining his life from substance abuse. He's willing to write this guy who's burning villages alive. He's willing to write this character who strangles her father in cold blood, like all of these other things he's willing to do. And I think it brings his, his characters and his story to greater heights. Like I always felt like there was this kind of tame element to Sanderson and, that is gone now and I, and I'm really enjoying it. And, and Teft is one of the examples in this book that, and of course all of Dalinar, but Teft too are, are examples of where I like to see him going. And I really enjoyed reading his, his POV. Yeah. Teft's an interesting character. We, I think he does a great job of personifying the idea that the Knights Radiant are like their power has come from their struggles, right? And I've heard people, obviously I'm uh, I'm a PhD student in counseling psychology and uh, I've seen a lot of folks in the social medias who are also in the mental health field who say that they recommend these books to their clients and patients. And it's it's pretty telling when you look at characters like Teft where it's like, hey, everyone goes through their struggles, but in a lot of ways that's where our strength comes from. And you look at Dalinar as well. Oh, he's saying like, you can't uh, take my pain from me because in a lot of ways that's that's how we grow. And I think uh, props to Sanderson for approaching like with Calden, depression, uh, with Teft, substance use disorders, all this stuff that – in the past, I think he he has kind of shied away from. So mm. I, think I do fantasy appreciate in general that. is very commonly like an escape, and it's about this guy who started out as like alone to becoming like this powerful guy with lots of friends that does the right thing, and and I think you know modern fantasy and a lot of modern people are looking for stories that they connect with more directly. It's hard to connect with. Someone like, for example, let's say Harry Potter, because he was just born and he's like, here's a ton of money and like, you're super good. Or it's really easy to connect with him because he has no personality and well, you can just insert yourself to be him, into but you're his not experience. not connecting with him emotion, like <laughs> emotionally like you could with someone like Kaladin or Teft or Shallan or sure. Dalinar, where it's like, hey, like, I've... I, I too murdered my whole thing. family. <laughs> uh, I mean, well, just my wife. Yeah. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Um, We've never making murdered a joke. Anyone, uh, <laughs> I have jokes. no wife, <laughs> and not because I not because I murdered her. <laughs> I was never never married. <laughs> uh, we need to look into this guy uh, pronto. <laughs> Nothing has made me think you've murdered your <laughs> wife more than just now this conversation that we're having. So, <laughs> I mean, it'd be impressive that. if I. Yeah, I got married behind your back and then murdered said wife behind your well, back. Well, it made sense so. why you kept him a secret. Yep. Didn't, but. Yeah, <laughs> that's, you know, that's you, true. You mentioned your background in clinical uh, psychology and... Counseling psychology. Counseling Charles. psychology, thank you. How dare you? How yes. dare you? Cool, whatever. <laughs> and um, you, you mentioned a couple <laughs> characters, but the one character you didn't mention and the character that... When I was listening to it, I was like, I got to remember to ask Dylan about this because I'm curious to get your perspective, especially with your uh, psychology background. And that is Shallan Um, and her use of her different personas 
as a way to kind of deflect her her personality. I don't know if I'm even explain. You might be able to even explain what she's doing better than I can. But in this book, more than others, it became almost concerning how much Shallan was like. Wait, this isn't the real me. Like I like this version of me better. They're way more badass and cool. And when I want to be badass and cool, I'll be them. And then it got to the point where it's like, oh, my boyfriend Adolin will probably like this person more, and I should just be them. You know, like this this kind of like not being able to separate herself from her personas that she was able to make through light weaving um, had these psychological impacts on her. I just wanted to get your, your, your take on it. What's like your thoughts on Shallan in this book and maybe some more insight into what was going on uh, in her mind when she was kind of giving in to these other identities. Sure. Yeah. It's, It's interesting because it evokes the idea of something called dissociative identity disorder, which is what uh, people used to be called and people more commonly know as multiple personality disorder. Uh, But uh, dissociative identity disorder is a really interesting topic in psychology because it's super controversial. It is recognized by the American Psychiatric Association as a uh, disorder. So, but it's very controversial where a lot of uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists don't believe in it. And of course, many do. Um, it's associated with a lot more like memory loss and stuff than you would, than you, what you're seeing from Shalon. Uh, but it is, yeah, it's interesting. Shalon's There's this video. Unique, <laughs> yeah. She's oh, yeah. I mean, Shalon, it's people, interesting because. But it's an illusion. Yeah, so with the illusions and the... But it is playing out psychologically for her that when she does the illusions, she's perceiving herself as an entirely different personality. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting about dissociative identity disorder is that it, it is believed to come out of trauma, right? So you, typically as a child, you're going through extremely painful things, maybe abuse, stuff like that, and... It is so painful that you almost start to create these other identities or personalities who you perceive as being strong enough to deal with those things. And it also is a way to escape from the person that you are experiencing the abuse as. And there's shades of that for sure in what Saracen's doing with Shallan, but I I don't think he's directly trying to depict someone with dissociative identity disorder just because you can tell when he's depicting depression with Kaladin. It's like, oh, this guy who I've heard Sanderson talk about this, he says he's never experienced depression, but he has worked really hard to try to understand, oh, what is it actually like? And uh, there's a character in Mistborn that you might remember that experiences depression that uh, he felt like I won't say who because spoilers, but it, Sanderson felt like he did not um, depict it as as well back then. And he's grown all these ways. And it's like you can see that in Calden. Like there's a lot of times where I'm like, oh, wow, like good on you, Sanderson. I can see you're working hard. You did your research. And with Shalon as having dissociative identity disorder, it does not seem like he wants to approach that directly and i don't think he would say that's what she has but he's kind of toying with these ideas of having this like core identity and then these alter personalities uh but yeah it's it's interesting there's a great there's like a video of someone who has this disorder who's like married that i I show and i'm teaching an intro to psych class right now and i show the video uh, and it's someone who's like in a marriage and there's like her husband is there and he's like, you know, I just found a way to get used to it. And it's like I'm married to all these different people. And she's literally going in and out of personalities in the video and like changing her voice and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, uh, it, yeah. And like. Shalon, <laughs> what's that? Must be what Adolin feels like. Yes, yes. So that's what I was trying to say. It it actually reminded me of when Shallan is 
toward the end of the book in that mode where she's like jumping in and out and she's like veil one second and then she's back to shallan and she doesn't know which one is really her she's just like and then next word she says is out of her mouth as radiant it's like whoa so it, was, it kind of, that actually kind of reminded me of the video maybe maybe i'll find that and send that to you charles but yeah it's it's interesting i didn't really know what to make of it i'd actually like to do some like looking into if sanderson has spoken on like is he trying to depict someone with that disorder in particular or Uh, not that's a good question it's it's not super accurate i would say no i mean it's it certainly evokes that because she's literally has multiple personalities but he doesn't like you said he's it's not like one takes over and it's like i'd like to speak to this person now it's like that's not what's happening like when she wants to be confident she'll put on an, uh, another person she'll make a confident persona when she wants to be like sexy she'll put on a sexy persona it's more of like a like a self-image thing and this is someone who yeah. kind of lived and- in the shadows of her brothers for so long and doesn't have as much self-worth as she wants and she's come a long way uh, but it's it's that, and I'd say also it's a self confidence, like self image thing, more than it is like a multiple personality disorder. Yeah, that's a great point, Charles, and it also has this element that you reminded me of that it's deliberate when Shalon creates a new personality, which is not in the disorder, where she's like, oh, I need someone who will be able to do a good job in these lessons that Aelin is giving me in how to use a shard blade. So I'll create this person who's really formal and uh, capable in this way, and her name is Radiant. And right, it's like, right. okay, now that's created. So maybe she starts so to lose herself like in it once she's created growing as it, a but... human being, she's like creating spin-off mm. versions of herself for each quality that she wants. And it's like, uh, there's this, it's an interesting kind of duality. Like when you have the ability to make yourself look different, you can start to act different. And then you, you see that as a separation from yourself. Uh, it, I think that's kind of like the direction that he's going i i think shallan is kind of stunted in a lot of ways and you know we know from the last book how much trauma that she had to go through um and she's also like lacking the confidence even though she's one of the radiance right she can light weave and do all kinds of crazy stuff she still is easily kind of intimidated unless she's Unless she's, I forget the name of the character. Is it Vin or what's Rin or what's the character name that she takes when she's um, tough and like radiant goes, or Veil? Veil, thank you. Vin is written. That's yeah. a different character from Mistborn. Um, You've named yeah, Mistborn, Poppy Vail. War, right? So, but I forgot Veil. All right, all right, right. So when she becomes when she needs to be tough and clever, she becomes Veil, and it's like you, you could just be tough and clever yourself. I mean, it started as a way to spy without like people realizing who she is but it became a crutch that she would use to um change things about herself or or not face things about her current person it's like i don't want to be confrontational i don't want to change i don't want to like do these other like people don't like me for these reasons so i've got to change myself to be liked by them like all those kind of interesting things that i feel like a lot of people would connect with um like in just in terms of like your own like dealing with your own self-worth and your self-confidence so it was interesting to see that and then at the end of this book you have adolin being like you know i like you the real you you know like whoever that is like if you take on like if you grow as a person and you out start acting tougher and more confident then i'm gonna like that too you don't have to be veil like i don't like veil i like you know the complications that are involved in, in in you. So I thought that was a really nice kind of, kind of message snuck into a, like the Dalinar story. I think we got a little, a really nice, uh, Shallan, uh, plot as well. And, and I thought there was a lot of interesting psychological stuff going on there with Shallan that, uh, I'm glad you were able to, to weigh in on. For sure. And it should also be considered that Shallan is a teenager. Yes. And maybe we don't think about that as often as we could. That's where a great point. 
it's really normal for teenagers, not in, to, not in a way where they start to lose which person they are or take on different names necessarily for those people. But it's really normal for teenagers in different situations to sort of like try out different selves, if you will. And I think Shallan's taking that to a much more extreme end, but she's still figuring out who she is as a person. And it's got all of this other, these, all, all these other complications and past trauma on top of it. So, uh, We'll give our girl Shalon a break here. She's mm. uh, yeah, she's just a teenager. Exactly, and I do like where her story's going. I like how she's dealing with the return of Yasna. You know, I almost forget that that happened in this book because <laughs> this, this book was so long. I was like, oh wait, Yasna comes back in this story. <laughs> like, like we knew she was alive in the epilogue of the last book, but I totally forgot that that whole confrontation and her being a student again, and then her trying to get away because she got used to being independent. Like that all happened in this book. Like crazy. So much has happened. <laughs> I feel the same way, Charles. And we definitely spread this read out longer than we have in past reads. So I kept having to think like, okay, wait, Elicar died in this one, right? And that was like in the middle of this book, I think. So it's when it's this long a book, yeah, there's going to be moments like that. And Yasna coming back was definitely much earlier than all of that stuff. And now she is going to be queen, which is interesting. There's that moment where Adolin turns everything down and he's just like, I killed Sadius. And his dad is like, oh, well, we can... We can deal with that. And he's like, no, like, I, I, I kind of said that because I don't want to be, be the king. <laughs> it's like, and then he's like, okay, fine. And they end up with Yasna. That's going to be interesting to see how that develops. You know why they probably uh, chose yeah. Yasna? Because everyone likes a ruler that has a good story. <laughs> <laughs> I know what that's a reference <laughs> to, okay. to. and who, that. yeah, <laughs> right, yes, who and who has had a better than story Yasna. than Yasna the Resurrected? Yeah, she came back from Yasna. the dead. To Yasna resume. the Broken. <laughs> Yasna the yeah. Broken, yeah. <laughs> exactly right. Oh, so God. The prophecy has been fulfilled, and I like that direction. I'm curious to see where it goes. But yeah, she comes back in this one, and that dynamic between her and Shalon is fun. Um, and her role continues to be one of that is pretty interesting. But um, you know, it, it, it's it's one of those things. It's like I'm curious to see Yasna in the in the ruling seat because she always seems to know what to do, and she's got her process, and you know, she does command a room uh, pretty well. So. We'll see where that goes. Yeah, Adolin rejecting the throne was an interesting... Like, that was a whole interesting scene of, like, I can't be king, I killed someone. It's like, bro, every king kills people. That's how you kind of be king. You have to like, kill other people. Right. What do you? How many people did your dad kill? And he's like, my dad will never understand. He's so honorable. It's like, your dad killed your GD mom, bro. It's like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> in a terrible way yeah i know it's so that didn't that part didn't really work where aelin is almost like a, a bluff i mean the real answer bluff, is he doesn't but, want you know, it's to just, be which is like okay he doesn't want fine. to yeah and i don't know that it felt a little it like one of those moments where sanderson made his characters do what he needed his plot to do he that part that point yeah it was just like oh right it's like Oh crap! If I kill Elokar, then and his son's so young, technically that makes Adolin next in line with the rules I set up with the world. But I don't want Adolin to be king, so and then it's like, oh, Yasna fits a lot better in this role. So I'll just have Adolin be like, I don't want to. Right, or even if you're like, oh, I want Yasna to be the the monarch, and it's like, how do I do that? Like I could kill Adolin, but I don't really want to. But I'll tease it though, because that's fun. But I won't actually do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess he just has to like abject the throne. So he did have a near death experience, and he did, you know, he is trying to be different. And I think that's kind of when you talk about this theme of like, what even is? How do you do the right thing when 
the environment is so GD uh, complicated and conflicting. Um, and it's the way the book ends, right? It's like my glory and my shame. It's kind of like acknowledging these parts of you that are you don't like and just acknowledging that you also want to be doing good in the world. And I think it's the combination of both. It's like, hey, I, I don't see myself as, as regal. I've done some horrible things. I'm trying to do good in my own way, and then that's where I'm going to go. It's an interesting exploration you know it's rare someone would give up power but uh for adolin that's that's what happens and i think in part of it it comes from him trying to realize like what's the like i i'm acknowledging these parts of myself that were like my flaws and i'm trying to go on and being king is not, not like in the cards for me and it's a mature response i suppose i'll give him that <laughs> it does get us conveniently to where we need yeah. to go in a very short amount of time but uh you know give him a little leeway there and then he gets I to believe marry adolin is what the the kids are calling a himbo charles have you heard of that no have you heard that word i'm not himbo I'm not cool enough <laughs> what is that yes so you know the the word bimbo Oh, I assume. So it's supposed to be I the see. male equivalent of that. A I himbo. see. Yes, he's totally yes. is that. <laughs> he totally is. Right. But there's a little so, bit of like know, empathy he's a handsome, towards him. Yeah. And... He sure. handles he's, Shalon He's just really kind of this well. like good looking dude. Well, yeah, I think that's actually part of it. It's like a himbo. It's not, it's not entirely derogatory. If anything, it's meant to be like endearing, like the characters that... Uh, people call himbos are usually characters that are l- liked by the readers, but they're just kind of not the sharpest tools in the shed. Uh, they don't really have any um, uh, sort of cunning to them. And they're usually these like good looking, well-meaning uh, guys. And I think that's, that's actually what Shalon needs with all of, everything she's got going on psychologically. I think she needs Adolin, who's like not an overly complicated guy and pretty mm-hmm. put together, you know, besides being a murderer. And, but I mean, if you're not a murderer in a Sanderson <laughs> book, it's like, what, what are you doing? Exactly. So, and it was Sadius that, uh, you know, that doesn't even count, especially because Sadius is immediately replaced by Amaram in a kind of, I don't know, felt like that was kind of contrived to me where the uh, Sadius's widow is like literally says, for all intents and purposes, Amram is now Sadius. It's like, <laughs> okay. Like, that was, that was definitely some housekeeping from Sanderson as well to just be like, I've got two Sadiuses. Sa- <laughs> Sadii? Is it Sadii, Charles? What's the plural of Sadius? Mm, well, you know, traditionally, if you go back to the Greek extension of the word, it is Sadius's. <laughs> uh, many people like to correct it and say it's Sadisi. It's not correct. Sadii. Sadii. <laughs> like octopi. Exactly. But I, I actually think yeah. it's octopuses, but uh, that's my... No. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a good grammar person, but I kind of remember being like, that's what everyone thinks is right, but, you know, uh, who knows? Anyway, the point is, yeah, I agree, but I do like this whole thing of, like, Amran going to the dark side, right? Full-on corrupted, ingested the stone that made them, like, this force of evil. It's in a way to compete with the Knights Radiant. It's cool. And now you have, like, this character... Like, this story has gone totally bananas because now you have characters that can fly and, like, legions of people that can fly and you're having battles in the air. Like, you've got, like, all kinds of spirits. It's it's, it's really, it's it, it feels like we're almost getting to, like, Dragon Ball Z territory now with the way these characters are fighting each other. Like, they've gone so far uh, from the back in the day where they were fighting, like, hand-to-hand combat to now they're just wielding these forces of power it, it, it's kind of fun how we've how the story's gone absolutely bananas <laughs> through kaladin's flying around it is i think that that's one of the things i love about sanderson's work is we always say he's uncynical and he's willing to 
err on the side of awesome, oh, yeah. I believe is what he says. And he does that a lot in the Stormlight Archive to just be like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to make Amaram super powered so we can have this epic battle with Kaladin. And mm. why not? And I, I appreciate that. I don't need everything to be overly explained to me. I'm like, let's let's get to the good stuff. Indeed, indeed. And the good stuff it was. And now you have people flying around fighting like evil powered guys. But Rock took him down. Hmm? Rock took him down. Oh, that yeah. was a cool moment. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Rock. <laughs> after the whole like that's it's another it's another uh, Sanderson move, I think, to... Uh, he's very patient, right? He's had for books, he's had... Uh, and by books here, we mean thousands of pages. Yes, exactly. He's had Rock be like, I, I don't fight, but they he's shown his skill with the bow. And then in the moment where it really counts and he's uh, trying to help out his buddy Calden that's when he he uses that bow so that that's a kind of cool moment i love rock so i wanted to give him his flowers there for that's true he does deserve all the props be for his, his moment of glory um and he's you know he's been like a he's been a rock you know, i would say in bridge four he's been kind of this Nailed guiding it. light this wisdom to some of the more wayward members of bridge four and uh we got to see a little bit of his homeland too which was kind of fun and uh you know it was i like getting more of the bridge four dynamic and uh it kind of paid off at the end i suppose didn't it <laughs> kaladin got his life saved <laughs> it is it did work out and charles i think we should also say a bit more about kaladin i, I think this was he took the biggest backseat of our main three i would say in mm-hmm. this book Right. It felt like Calden, who was definitely the star of book one at this point, you know, he gets his arc, but it's, I think, did we say this about like Dalinar in the previous book, right? It's like, he, he gets his moments, but you can tell it's not his book. And yeah, no. we get to see Calden, he goes, he goes back home for a little bit. And yes, that did happen in this book. I had to check. Uh, he uh, gets to kind of see a little bit of the Parshendi side of things, and that helps build empathy for the other side of the conflict, right? Even before we get the big reveal that we're the baddies here. And he, he also gets his time on the wall guard, and he meets a woman named Azure in this, which which is also one of our friend's ex's name, so I just could not get that <laughs> out of my head, Charles. <laughs> I know, I know. I was judging them right uh, away. <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a lot of judgment going on there. And I was like, hi, Marshall Azure, and I'm just uh, imagining a person who would not make a lot of sense as a high marshal, but <laughs> it's... <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh friends x is the side uh, that character charles i don't know how to speak about this without spoilers i don't i don't know what the best way to handle this is but it does feel like a critical moment for this book and for the larger cosmere this character is is from another book did you pick hmm. up on who this character is no it's from a book you've read oh Azure is from another book, huh? Interesting. Under a different name. Huh. I can. Can I? Uh, I can Google. Can it I say there's going to be spoil? Yeah, you Google it. You Google. Uh, I'll Google I kind of want to talk about it, but I guess, I guess we can't. Hmm. Like, I'll just say this character is plays a a large role in a previous book in the Cosmere and this is one of the big moments I think where you see Sanderson taking a step into kind of trying to create his own Cosmere literary universe like the equivalent of a Marvel Cinematic Mm -hmm. Universe where he is uh, bringing together main characters he he also does that with um with the sword uh that uh, um uh, that oh god 
I'm completely blanking on the Shin guy's name. Um, the Charles, what's the name of in, uh, in uh, Truthless of Shinovar? <laughs> Uh, I, don't, What's his I was name? so focused on reading about uh, Azure, who I did find out what the other book they were from, and that's very interesting, actually. Um, yeah, but either, either way, I'll you know I'll I'll figure it out. But point being, uh, this is a big moment for the Cosmere because we're we're actually getting like very clear crossover it's still kind of in easter egg territory here where you don't need to have read the previous book to appreciate this but there's there's definitely sort of that joint universe forming and it uh, i'll just say without spoilers that it, it picks up even more in mistborn um era two with especially the lost metal so that's something to keep an eye on i think as we get further and further it's going to turn the the cosmere is going to turn more and more into something where like reading all the books is important in the same way that watching all the different marvel movies is important and that's kind of interesting from a guy who in sanderson who is able to become a number one new york times number one new york times bestseller while writing in the fantasy genre, so I'm I'm curious to see where he that goes sell from more rights, meta perspective. The, the movie rights someday we'll get a film, <laughs> like we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes. yeah, that's true as well. But um, that's super interesting. You know, I I'm not as like well read up on all these characters in the greater cosmere so i do have some catching up to do but i did just look them up and that's uh that's interesting i did not get that one right over my head i didn't catch it at all <laughs> so i gotta brush up on oh, my yeah. cosmere. there's some i know it's been a while since you you read that book that was like there are some moments FDF. that when you yes that was before fdf but there are some moments in there that are are good easter eggs for for people who have read that one. Huh. Can I say which I can say which book. You can say the right? book. Yeah. It's, Why not? It's Warbreaker. Yeah. It's Warbreaker. You can read that for free. Yeah. On Sanderson's website, I believe. So give that a read. It's also been published, so you could pay money for it as well. <laughs> you want Yes, to. definitely pay money for <laughs> a thing that you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> the Sanderson guy, I mean I really worry about his livelihood. I mean, <laughs> he, how many million did he make off the Kickstarter, Charles? Is it going to be enough to feed his family? What, tens of millions of dollars for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, Okay. I think that's enough millions where, you know, they'll, they'll be able to live a modest life over there. So mm-hmm. I'll say just get the thing that this man is giving to you for free or, you know, buy the book if you want on your bookshelf. I, I own it, so... Do as I say, not as I do. I just didn't know. I didn't know that. I didn't know it was free when I bought the book. <laughs> I knew it I was I wish free. I could say it was something nobler than that. I read it for free, um, uh, as Sanderson intended when he originally wrote it. So, um, yeah. I mean, the character Seth, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. Seth is the character that I couldn't remember. And his sword is also from Warbreaker. Oh, cool. Yeah, Seth. Seth was cool. You know, he, he, we got a little more. We got like in the previous books, he was just like this, almost like force of nature going around. And now here he is doing all kinds of stuff. You know, we got to see him. Like you can tell, his part is only growing. When you think of like epic fantasy sagas, it's kind of nice to see across the books how characters can swing certain ways whether you're like moash who's just descended into villainy and and then you have someone like zeph who's like trying to go through some kind of more like fleshing out his character like getting actual character from this guy it is is very interesting one who like directly opposed kaladin in the last book so yeah it's interesting to see how these things change and how the power levels to use another dbz term now uh change and fluctuate as well so yeah it, sanderson's a master plotter master outliner and uh 
looking forward to seeing where the rest of this series goes. We've got one more actual published book, and then there's so many more in the can planned for Sanderson that uh, we'll have to see what, what's coming next. But I'm excited, man. Got to brush up on my Cosmere in the meantime. That you do, Charles. I think that it's going to be interesting to get into that fourth book. I haven't read it yet. And I, I want to know where everything yeah, goes. Rhythm I of War. I feel right? like it's exciting. Yeah. And then I wonder when the release date is for, for I don't know book what five. the fifth book is called. No yeah. idea. I'm sure Sanderson has Let's a name see. and a status on it and all that stuff. You know how he gets. Yes. All right. Stormlight Art. I don't know if it has a name. Oh. It's Knights of Wind and Truth is the working and likely final title of the fifth book. That doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like any of the other titles. I'm going to say, you heard it here first, it won't be called that. Knights <laughs> because... of Wind doesn't have a ring to it, really, if we're being honest. Knights of Truth. Yeah, Knights of Truth. That's Who cares one. about Wind? <laughs> Knights of Truth. Yeah, that's a good one. And Sanderson. Do you really need... Come on. It's been always like noun of nouns, except for Oathbringer, but it's never been blank of blank and blank, noun of noun and noun. Yeah. I don't know. I'm Getting telling you right now, this book is not going to be called Knights of, yeah, this book is not going to be called Knights of Wind and Truth. This book is going to be called Knights of Truth. I will eat Ooh. one of Charles's socks. <laughs> wow. If they- <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I had to give up a sock this... for this. <laughs> Put a sock on the line. I didn't fall into it. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. But it, you don't have to worry about it, Charles, because this book ain't going to be called Knights of Wind and Truth. But what it will be is potentially released doo, 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 ba, 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 November 2024. That's a lot right of time yeah, for him to way. change the title to <laughs> Knights of Truth. <laughs> I, maybe he'll come to that realization so. soon, but that's a lot of time for us to wait, dude. We kind of hit these Stormlight Archive books hard, like back to back to back almost. So yeah, a lot of downtime, but uh, we're not going to jump well, right we'll, into We'll give it before. some time. We'll yeah. give it some time. We'll go actually, as far as we can while still remembering what happened in these previous books i think right because i'd rather give it time so i don't have to reread like three thousand five hundred pages uh oh god and plus rhythm of war four thousand whatever pages to remember what's going on by the time knights of truth comes out and i yeah i want to be able to just jump right in I don't know. I guess there's people who reread all the time. That's a lot. That's a lot That's for me a lot. to do. That's a lot. That would be that would be reading most of these books three times. I mean, that <laughs> to me is epic fantasy. A ton. <laughs> it asks a lot of the reader. It takes a lot to read through an epic fantasy series, even one as entertaining as, as Sanderson's. And it's like to go. I don't think they're meant to be read back to back to back. So it's like. It's. I'm looking forward to a palate cleanser, I'll say that, but not for too long. I do want to get into Rhythm of War. I do want to be caught up on the Stormlight Archive, and I'm sure we will find ways in which to to catch up on the series in time for the next book's release, whatever it may be called, in November 2024. But for now, we got Oathbringer, and then we got Rhythm of War. And we've got all kinds of other fun series in the mix as well. We just wrapped up Friends Pitching Fantasy, so we've got two exciting new books coming up. Three, I guess. Uh, at this point, we can yeah. say what the picks were because <laughs> because uh, well, this episode will air after uh, FPF week. Um, so, yeah, we got Black Tongue Thief and we've got Jade War, two heavy hitters. So we're really excited to get into those. And they're a departure from Epic Fantasy as well. So I think we're doing a good job. And then we'll come right back into King Killer, I think. We may as well, right? 
uh, King Killer. Gosh, I keep King doing Killer? that. Stormlight Archive. I will get right back into Stormlight Archive. <laughs> For some reason, I want to keep calling it King Killer. I'm like, well, it did start with a king getting killed, you know, it's King Killer Chronicles. And in this book, too, a king was killed. So, like, I don't know. True. How many kings I mean, have been in killed King Killer, in the King Killer Chronicle? Up for debate. In, <laughs> I don't uh, want to spoil it. <laughs> yes, that's, yeah. Certainly up for debate, but I would say uh, far more kings have been killed in the Stormlight Arc. Far that more. much we can all far agree more. on. Maybe yeah. Sanderson could change the name of the series. <laughs> He's like, I'm King Killer now. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be right. Wild. <laughs> yeah, I mean, after a certain amount of publications from Sanderson compared to Rothfuss like if he hits 200 while Rothfuss is still two I think he should get rights to the name and also isn't there a thing or it's you know it passes like the the trademark expires you know and it becomes public domain after a certain point (laughs) I think that's a lot I think we have like didn't like Winnie the Pooh just hit that yeah (laughs) didn't Winnie the Pooh just hit that I think we're a ways off before quote of the King Killer Chronicle hits that point but the original story as the character is is public domain and it's kind of weird but yes so eventually it will enter public domain and we can change the name at that point. But we don't want Sanderson to be bogged down with a lawsuit right now. So we'll just, we'll bide our time, but <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> yeah. All right. If this doesn't happen <laughs> no, in 80 years, not. <laughs> I will not eat anyone's socks, but you will see. <laughs> Charles, you can say you'll do whatever you want in 80 years. <laughs> Cause I mean, you know, hopefully you make it to, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully but i will be uh, one of the oldest yeah hopefully ever. you end up a hundred and yeah <laughs> hopefully you end up a hundred and ten uh in the oh wait charles sorry did i a hundred no, it's a hundred and ten yes thank you it's in the hundred oh. tens teenager in the teens oh yeah but it's not a hundred eleven how old are you charles <laughs> I'm 31 years young. So 80 years is it? 111. Yeah, is my math one, right? One. Are all okay. the stars aligning. Okay, yeah, you said it wasn't. <laughs> okay, either way, hopefully when you're 111, uh, you know, well, even it, when you live that long, no one will remember that you said you would eat a sock if a thing did or didn't happen. Me, I'm actually putting myself at risk. Yeah, you are at <laughs> yeah. a much more imminent risk. I'm at risk. I said, yeah, a I Sanderson book. A when the next Sanderson book comes look out. look into my own mortality. So thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, well, Pers- once you've had a cold look into your own mortality, what's there left to do but play <laughs> that sweet, sweet outro music, uh, Charles? Just as we march because slowly into death. all we and- <laughs> can hope for, yes. Eventually, your life will be playing that sweet, sweet outro music. Indeed. This is as, what as they'll be we- playing as I'm lowered into the ground <laughs> in yes. probably way less than 80 years. <laughs> but you never know uh, who's counting. I Charles, wasn't until now. Yeah, if but, I live uh, long enough, <laughs> if I live long enough, I'll make sure that they know that your wish was to be lowered to our sweet, sweet outro music. Yes, and for people to rate five stars. You know, that's my undying wish oh, too. <laughs> if, oh, if Charles, if I'm gonna if have Charles dying dies, wishes, you, you just, let's go yeah. bigger. We can do the five star rating. You know, that's. Just, I mean, come on. There'll be like a little tablet passed around uh, at the funeral. People have to sign in <laughs> yes. and then rate five stars. <laughs> because this is my legacy. Guys. His dying wish. Think about how many episodes we'll have yes. at that point. When I'm 110 I mean, dead. <laughs> Think of all the episodes. 111, Charles. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so that's a lot of episodes, right. guys. 111. And uh, one shot, what one sock short of where you would have been <laughs> otherwise when this is inevitably called Knights of Wind and Truth. Well, you know, maybe so. I'll get, um, I'll be two socks short when this, the, like the series doesn't change its name. Yeah. And then we'll be, have come like full mm. circle, you know, it's like a thematic moment of finality. Mm-hmm. And, and if we each eat one together. sock from the, 
from the same pair, I feel like that is a level of connection. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Few few have reached in exactly. in any friendship. Exactly. So it's like we each have a sock inside of us from the same pair of socks. Yes. And <laughs> I, I don't truly understand how digestion works. <laughs> Because this is 80 <laughs> years apart that we're eating, uh, approximately. Yeah, maybe it's some songs. undigestible but, fiber that will just sit in your body. <laughs> I don't know. We're going way too far off. The true. Rails. We were so close to playing the outro. I know, and I okay. nailed it with the seg, too. You did nail it with the like, seg. I think we got to get back to that. And um, there's nothing left for us to do but play that sweet, sweet outro music. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody thank you all so much for listening to yet another very exciting episode of the friends talking fantasy podcast if you like what you heard today if you want to support the show or talk to us even the best way to do that is over on the socials that's at the ftf podcast on instagram and at the ftf podcast with a number one at the end on twitter now dylan if they like what they heard today and they want to support the show even further than following us on social media what can they do toss five stars to our podcast you can do that over on spotify where most of you are listening uh, by just two clicks over at the top of the friends talking fantasy podcast feed you can also rate and review on apple podcasts and we always really appreciate any of those things that you do but just listening is more than enough hearing us ramble on for an extra five to ten minutes about charles untimely demise (laughs) that's what we want from you and we just really appreciate it well you know what they say dylan it's journey over destination and life before death Mm. and rating five stars before (laughs) uh anything else but you know what just listening before rating five stars i would say (laughs) is probably the oath that you guys would take because you're all awesome just for listening that's more than enough you're all nights radiance right in our eyes i swear to rate five stars to podcasts even (laughs) those i hate yeah (laughs) there you go there you go i like that yeah that is before that's an ideal (laughs) right downloads before ratings uh, I don't know. I don't have any Spotify before Apple Podcasts. Oh wow, that's a that's a stand right there. And uh, you know what, guys, you're awesome. Thank you so much for listening to this. We'll spare you all having to deal with any more, even though you swore the oath. So we'll oh, make it. I easy got one more. You. Oh, let's hear it. Intro music before sweet sweet outro music. <laughs> Always. That is the oath. Dude, you're glowing now from that 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 final oath. Your, your <laughs> friend has now right. bonded you. So you can now fly and do all kinds of other awesome things. So, guys, thank you for listening. I promise we're going to leave now. You guys are awesome. Thank you all so, 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 so much. And as always, go forth and conquer, friends.